the charge here anyway? It's certainly not pilot. I imagine the conversation around the dinner table at Pilate's household that night. His wife, Drusilla, that's her name according to legend, says to him, So honey, how was your day? Miserable. Miserable. Don't they know I'm the Roman governor? And I'm walking back and forth between Jesus and the authorities here in Jerusalem. I can't get a straight answer out of anyone. Poor Pilate, who so much of what he says in this gospel sounds like he's just frustrated and exasperated, taunting the Jewish authorities. Do you want me to crucify your king? But they've already said he's not their king, but he doesn't care because he's probably got the worst posting in the Roman Empire. And then trying to get even a little bit of information out of Jesus that can help him make the case to let him go. Poor Pilate, caught in exasperation and cynicism, taunting those around him, finally riding on the cross, the king of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. You don't like it, take a hike. I'm the governor, in case you forgot. Pilate's not in charge. He knows it. He feels it. And it frustrates him to death. The Jewish authorities aren't in charge either. You can sense their anxiety. For a while now, they've been plotting to get rid of this troublemaker, this itinerant preacher, this rabble-rouser, who, who's going to stir up the crowds and destroy the very fragile peace that they have here in Jerusalem between the governing Roman authorities who are seen, and rightfully so, as oppressors, and their own hold on power over this whole temple cult and here's this Jesus threatening to unbalance the whole thing. And so long ago they plotted to get rid of him. And Lazarus in the bargain, who just becomes a witness to the power of this Jesus. But what if Pilate doesn't agree? What if the only one in the society at that time who has the authority to enact capital punishment decides on leniency instead? Or life imprisonment or something like that? We want him done. We want him gone. We want him finished. And you can sense their anxiety as their accusations escalate. If you let this man go, you're no friend of the emperor. Because the emperor said that he was son of God. And Pilate's anxiety increases in response. And then, in words of shocking self-condemnation. We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. And God gets kicked to the curb. God, the only real king Israel ever had. Ever happened to you? You say something you don't really mean just to save your skin or to get the thing that you want and you can always apologize later or, or take it back or change the story unless you can't. And so the Jewish authorities say, we have no king but Caesar. Sorry, God. Can you let us off the hook for that one? And, and all to maintain their authority and control and this fragile peace that within 40 years would be shattered anyway and the temple destroyed and the people dispersed and scattered and thrown out of Jerusalem. The Jewish authorities, the local folk, both religious and secular, they're not in charge here. How about those disciples? They've learned something over the last three years. A long time ago, Jesus had told them that this was his destiny. Even to the detail of the cross, they knew what was coming. And with knowledge and foresight comes peace. Except, 
in the garden, they were ready to pull out swords. They're ready for the insurrection, the revolution. Finally, we get to throw out the Roman oppressors and all those toadies who are underneath them. Finally, we get to run things. Peter, blessed Peter, is so impulsively in favor of this idea that he pulls out his sword and cuts off a man's ear. We can thank God that Peter didn't have better aim, or this would have been a much more dramatic and controversial story. <laughs> Only to be rebuked by Jesus, put the sword away. It doesn't go this way, Peter. It doesn't go this way. We're not doing too well finding out who's in charge. So far, we've eliminated most of the prominent parties in the story, except for one. Except for the one who's in charge. Who never really claims that authority. Who never really lays claim to that power. In John's account of the Passion, Jesus holds absolutely all the cards. Now, I don't know about you, but that little scene there where the high priest is interrogating Jesus, and he says, if you want to know what I'm all about, just ask the people who have been listening to me. They can tell you. And in reaction to that, one of the high priest's soldiers, indignant at that kind of an attitude on the part of Jesus, slaps him in the face. It says, is that the way you talk to the high priest? And maybe the answer is yes, only if you're over him, have more authority than he has. But that wasn't being recognized at the time. And instead, Jesus says, if I've spoken something that's not right, then you can chastise me. But if I've told the truth, why do you hit me? Where are you coming from? I think, too, and this may not be quite right, but you can get back to me on this, that Jesus almost taunts Pilate. In the midst of his frustration and anxiety and exasperation, Jesus says these things, or doesn't say things, that only make Pilate even crazier. For this I came, to testify to the truth. And Pilate's thinking, listen, man, your life is in my hands. Talk to me straight, or you're going to be dead. But Jesus is in charge here. He knows what he's doing. He understands his mission and responsibility, even to the point of giving himself to be crucified. telling Peter to put away the sword and the soldier of the high priest not to slap him, that he's only reacting out of his own frustration, telling Pilate that his integrity has nothing to do with the Roman occupying forces. And then at the end, at the crucifixion itself, it's pretty remarkable. The only one who knows what to do, well, other than the soldiers, in their self-serving interests. The only one who knows what to do is Jesus. He sees his poor mother totally bereft at this unjust loss of her son. And he makes provision for her. From the cross, sisters and brothers, this isn't a calm bedside arrangement for after I'm dead. This is Jesus being crucified, being sent to the electric chair for a crime he didn't commit on trumped up charges, taking the time to get out of that and saying to his mother and the beloved disciple, take care of one another. Did you notice how many times in the reading of the Passion that John puts in the note to fulfill the scripture? 
He said he was thirsty to fulfill the scripture. They didn't break his legs to fulfill the scripture. It's like Jesus has come upon this event in his life fully in possession of what he needs to do. Jesus is in charge here. So that at the very end, he says, and this only in John's Gospel, it is finished. Or in a more colloquial translation, I'm done. I did what I had to do. It's complete. My work is over. So as you kind of wrap your head around all of the action that takes place and what it is that we're doing here tonight, keep your eyes on Jesus. I want to highlight one of the notes in the introductory paragraph to our service tonight. While it is indeed solemn, Good Friday is not the funeral Jesus never had. Solemn and sad, solemn and certainly heartbreaking, but maybe not for Jesus' sake. You see, as I, as I struggle with Good Friday, which in its very name causes a kind of cognitive dissonance there, a, a tension, Good Friday, we're celebrating the crucifixion of Jesus. As I struggle with Good Friday, and I do this every year, but hopefully with a little more clarity each year, or a different perspective on what this day means, I struggle with that tension between this victorious Jesus who is fully in charge, and the fact that he's crucified. And then what does that mean for us? If it's not the funeral Jesus never had, it's still tragic, isn't it? Well, only this way, only this way perhaps, my sisters and brothers, that we haven't learned anything from that. That the reason Jesus gave himself in full power, with complete intentionality, was so that we would get the message <coughs> and be transformed ourselves. And I think what this little note means is that if we come together on a Good Friday and we look at the cross and we ponder the nails and we think about the suffering and focus only on the tragedy of Jesus' death and the pain involved and don't see the Father's intention behind this to reconcile God to all people and all people to one another, then it might as well be our funeral because we haven't embraced the life latent in this event. I have a, a little bit of a dramatic streak, perhaps, or, or even a maudlin streak, a little bit of a maudlin streak that, that likes to be grumpy sometimes. And so I want to pretend on Good Friday that there's no Easter. I just want to be sad. Your proper response to that is, you're crazy. <laughs> But what kind of blows my mind about John's perspective on all of this is he says that you don't have to wait three days for the glory. It's right there on the cross. Jesus says, and I, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. There's the glory in this self-giving God who's willing to give us a different picture of who we are. No longer mired in the fear of death. Oh, we don't embrace it, generally speaking. And when it comes to those we love and care about, we don't celebrate, unless it's entirely merciful, 
Grief is still a part of our experience, and we mourn, and we must. But for our own loss, for the hole that opens inside of us, for the many places of emptiness. But we do not mourn as those who have no hope. And so this dissonance between cross and glory, Friday and good, means that Jesus has always, already and always overcome all those forces that would separate us from God. Or to put it in the words of Martin Luther, the cross is like a fish hook that catches sin, death, and the devil, and they have no more power. So if you ask the question, as you look around the world, who's in charge here, despite appearances to the contrary, it is not sin, death, and the devil. It's God. And one day God, in full vindication, will reveal that power and authority. Why not today? God's giving us a chance to catch up. God's giving us a chance to look at this crucified and risen Savior and say, with the full force of who we are as children of God, no more. If death does not have the last word, then we in our lives are called to behave as if death does not have the last word. If death does not have the last word, then we in our lives are called to live as advocates for life with every fiber of our being because we know the outcome, because we know how the story ends, because we know who's in charge. If the devil does not have the last word, then we throw ink wells at him. Disregard him when he whispers in our ear. Reject his power and authority, which is transient and weak, and do not cooperate with evil. If sin does not have the last word, then we sin no more. Would that it were that easy. But we make it our goal under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to live the transformation of the crucified and risen Savior. We do not cooperate, do not participate, do not advocate with those forces that oppose the gracious and life-giving will of God because we know who's in charge here. And so maybe the reason that Good Friday is a solemn occasion and not a funeral is because the reality of this vindicating God who will come and just sweep everyone away in this awesome tide of love and grace and newness makes us stand back and gasp. Why? How could God do this? Paul understood. In his own transformation as a human being, eventually his eyes were opened, literally. And he said, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What good news. What a good day. That nothing is true now and not just in the future. And you are invited to witness to that. To surrender to the power of that. To know deep in your heart that you are the target of that love. You are the apple of God's eye. And no price is too great to let you know that.
we will be human, sisters and brothers. We will be who we are in this fallen world. But we are also the people God has made us to be. We will fear, we will grieve, we will hate, we will speak words we shouldn't speak and do things we shouldn't do and fail to rise to the occasion when we ought to. And then we will ask forgiveness and resolve and surrender to a better way. Because despite appearances to the contrary, you know as much as I, who's really in charge.